the book of Nehemiah. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. And last week, we read through the entire book of Nehemiah. Today we'll start preaching through it. Um, I hope we got a sense last week, those of us who were here, of the scope of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a problem solver. He gets the walls of Jerusalem built. He gets the temple cleansed. He stops the violations of the Sabbath and the idolatrous intermarriages. It's easy to look at Nehemiah and, and just see him solely as an example for us to imitate. He's a man with the right priorities who gets things done. And, and he is an example for us to imitate. But far more importantly, Nehemiah, both as an individual and through the book bearing his name, is a display of God's glory, God's goodness, and God's grace. Nehemiah is a type of Jesus Christ. The good things we see in Nehemiah, we see in their perfection in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The good things accomplished by Nehemiah on behalf of the people of Israel are reflections of the greater works accomplished by Jesus Christ on behalf of the people of God. And so as we work through the book of Nehemiah verse by verse, there will be plenty of places where we'll stop and we'll say, be like Nehemiah, you should act like this. But far more importantly, as we go through, will be the frequent places where we stop and say, Behold our God. See His character. See what He has done for us. And we'll reach that first stopping point, the first scenic overlook, in the first four verses of the first chapter. So today, it's Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Let us read the text. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province, who had survived the exile, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now some background information, because we might get lost if we just jump right in here. Chislev is the month of the Jewish calendar, roughly um, corresponding to November and December. So we are in right around the month of Chislev right now. Um, this is the 20th year, is the, the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. That puts us in 440 BC. Um, Nehemiah is the last book of Old Testament history. We don't have any divinely inspired record of the history of Israel from the book of Nehemiah until we come to the birth of Jesus Christ. So 440 B.C. as this book begins. Remember, the first wave of Judean exiles, Daniel and those with him, were taken into captivity in Babylon in 605 B.C. The temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. King Cyrus allows the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in 536 B.C. And it's not until 516 that the temple is actually rebuilt. Many of the Jews, even when they were allowed to return to Jerusalem, decided rather to stay in Babylon, or in Persia at that point. Um, Thirteen years prior to where the book of Nehemiah begins, in 500, I'm sorry, 453 BC, Ezra was sent from Artaxerxes to go to Jerusalem to establish and teach and enforce the law of God. Nehemiah was one of the ones who stayed in Persia. Even when Ezra went 13 years earlier, he didn't go. We don't know why. We can speculate, but we don't have enough information. Maybe he was just too young 
to go 13 years ago. We don't know how old Nehemiah is. Maybe he didn't see any need to go. He thought, well, Ezra's, Ezra's got this handled. Maybe he just liked the position that he's in. We were told at the end of chapter 1 that Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. I know that sounds to us like a very menial position. You're, you're a servant, you're a butler, maybe first footman. But it's actually a very high and very important position in the Persian court. It gives Nehemiah regular access to the halls of power. It gives him great personal prestige and significant personal wealth. Maybe he saw his position as an opportunity to accomplish great things for God in Persia. He stands right next to King Artaxerxes every day. Or maybe he just liked being important. Either way, Nehemiah knew there were a number of Jews in Jerusalem, but he was happy to be in Susa, the citadel, the, the summer capital of the Persian Empire, until his brother comes to visit when Nehemiah asked his brother Hanani how things were going in Jerusalem, the report was not good. He says, verse 3, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. He tells him the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. Its gates are destroyed by fire. And again, we, we need to think like ancient Israelites. I know we don't build walls around our cities today. But they were absolutely vital to the security of ancient cities before airplanes and parachutes and bombs made walls far easier to just skip over or knock down than they are to build. A strong wall was the essential protection of a city. With a wall, a small force of soldiers could hold off much larger armies and the people inside could rest securely. Without a wall, any criminal, any bandit, any foreign army could come and go and kill and steal almost at will. The people could never be at peace. They could never be at rest because they were in constant danger without a wall. Especially when they're living in the midst of a hostile people. And their weakness and their defenselessness was obvious to everyone around them. It was not only dangerous for Jerusalem not to have walls, it was, it was disgraceful. The city was completely at the mercy of every other city, every other people, every other group in their region. Anyone could go in and attack them. Take whatever they wanted at, at any time. Without a wall, the exiles were weak, powerless, pitiful, defenseless, and in constant danger. Great trouble and shame. Something had to be done. And Nehemiah would be the one to do it. Um, we, we know what Nehemiah did. He built the wall. But before we consider the, the process that Nehemiah went through in building the wall, we need to consider what motivated him to do this. Why would he leave his important job in an important city with a very important person? Why would he leave this position of comfort and prestige and privilege to make this long journey to a minor province to complete a difficult and fiercely opposed task. Why? Why do it? Nehemiah was motivated by concern for the exile's condition. He was motivated by compassion over their troubles. And that concern and that compassion is expressed in his immediate response to the news. Again, verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah feels grief and sorrow for the Jews in Jerusalem. And he expresses that grief. He mourns. Do, do we ever mourn? Have we ever mourned like this? We don't do it very often. I want to consider this morning four aspects of Nehemiah's mourning and, and consider ourselves in light of that example. First, Nehemiah's mourning was heartfelt. It was, it was genuine. Nehemiah isn't just putting on a display for the sake of his brother or the, or the sake of the other um, exiles who come with him. He's, he's not acting sad. He's mourning, genuinely mourning, because he's overcome with great grief 
far too often for, for me at least, and I, I don't, I might be worse than anyone else, but I don't think I'm the only one. Um, I'm, I'm in a situation where I know I'm supposed to feel sad about this. My, my second cousin three times removed has died, and I don't think I have a second cousin three times removed. But you know, some, some distant relative has, has died or, or something has happened to someone and you're, you're supposed to look sad so you wear the dark clothing and you go to the funeral and you look very solemn. But it, it doesn't really move us. We're not personally affected by their death. We're just, we're just supposed to look sad. We're supposed to act like we're mourning. Um, if you've watched the series Downton Abbey, um, there's a very good example of this right at the very beginning of the first episode. Um, the series starts with the sinking of the Titanic and the news arrives at Downton Abbey. The family reads the news and all oh, those poor people and then they get a telegram telling them that their cousins and heirs, James and Patrick Crawley, were on the Titanic when it sank and now it becomes personal especially because Patrick had gotten privately engaged to Mary, the oldest daughter of the family. And when Mary is informed that her fiancé has just drowned on the Titanic, her immediate response is, does this mean I have to go into full mourning? Because in 1900s England, there were standards. Of, you know, you had to wear this much black for this much time based on how close you were to the people who died. Um, she, she didn't love Patrick even though she was engaged to him. All she cared about was how, how am I expected to express grief over this? I don't actually feel any grief, but what do I have to do? And when her father tells her that it's, it's up to you, how you mourn for this. You don't. You have to mourn him as a cousin. It's up to you whether you want to mourn him as a fiancé or not because it hadn't been announced. She says, well, that's a relief. She, there's, there's no actual mourning there at all. She'll wear black because she has to with the rest of the family, but, but she's not grieving his loss. Um, a few years later, she marries Matthew, and then Matthew dies, and she's come to love Matthew, and she genuinely mourns. Matthew. It's a difference between just an expression of grief and, and the true grief. I've often been guilty of the same as Lady Mary, although I wouldn't have ever said, well, that's a relief. Um, outward mourning, if not accompanied by a true inward heartfelt mourning, is, is <clears throat> meaningless. It, it does nothing beyond possibly preserving some relationships or fulfilling some expectations. For mourning to have any true value or have any significant impact or change in our lives, this mourning must be genuine and from the heart, as Nehemiah's is. He's not just saying a few words in solidarity with his brother in these exiles. He, he's genuinely mourning for them. But in addition to being genuine, Nehemiah's mourning was extended. The, the weeping and the fasting didn't last for a few minutes or a few hours or the rest of the day. He sat down and wept and mourned for days and continued fasting. So often, again, I feel like I'm speaking a lot too and about myself here. I can be genuinely moved to sorrow by something, but then we quickly forget it. And, and move on. In fact, that's often the advice we receive and the advice we give others when they're, when they're mourning, when they're grieving. Get over it. Cheer up. Move on. Stop thinking about whatever it is that's making you sad and start thinking about something pop positive, something happy. That's why, in my house at least, we, we change the channel whenever the uh, Humane Society commercials come on because... They're playing sad music, and those dogs and cats look so incredibly sad. And I don't want to be sad. So I'm going to change the channel and wait until it's over. Um, but we do that with bigger things, too. We, we try to stop mourning about things, not because the source of our sorrow has, has ended, but just because we don't want to mourn. 
we, we want to focus on something else, to think about something else, to ignore or neglect what's causing our, our grief. And our society pushes us so hard in that direction. Again, we're constantly just told to think about the, the positive things. Don't think about these negative things. And we have this constant, inexhaustible supply of distractions right in our pocket. Why, why should you focus on this thing that's making you sad when you can just pull out your phone and here's Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, and whatever else. You can get all the memes you want and all the silly pictures of cats that you want and all the videos that you want and stories. Here's words with friends and here's Fortnite and, and all these other games you can play to, to take your focus and your concern. Our society tells us why waste time being sad when you can just pull out your phone and at least find, if not happiness, at least amusement. But we're not dealing with our sorrow, we're, we're masking it. Grief must be felt and endured. We, we can't, we shouldn't deny it. We, we shouldn't just drown it out with distractions. We need to truly deal with our sorrow, and that takes time. Nehemiah endured his grief, his, his sorrow was extended. It was genuine, and it was extended. But there's also a danger in staying in our grief, and, and that's why our society encourages us to move on and get over it, because it, it doesn't do any good to dwell in your grief forever and ever and ever without hope. And our society has lost its hope. Nehemiah's grief was, was heartfelt, it was extended, but it was also hopeful. We're often tempted, our society has, has no choice other than to grieve as those who have no hope. When they reject Christ, they're, they're rejecting all hope. So there are situations that, that cannot be fixed, problems that cannot be solved, things that will never get better. So the options are either just forget about it, don't think about it, or just abandon hope and hurt forever. And we want to think, if not say, I've thought this to myself so many times, the words of Job's wife to Job as he's suffering, just curse God and die. There, there's nothing, there's, this isn't going to get better. Curse God and die. We, we think there's nothing else to do, but we'd be wrong to think that way because there is hope in all of our suffering and in all of our sorrows. There is hope. It's not in ourselves. It's not necessarily in our immediate situation, but there is hope in God's goodness and grace. Ultimately, there is hope in Jesus Christ. This doesn't mean that if you have enough faith and you do the right things, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Or that you'll always be able to reverse every bad situation that, that comes upon you. But it does mean that no situation, no problem, no tragedy is outside of the control of God. And we have the promises of God that in the world to come, He will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more sorrow. And we will see how in, in God's good and perfect providence, everything, even the very worst of things, has been worked by God for our good. God is in control and God is good. And so as we mourn, we should never be overwhelmed by our sorrow. We mourn with hope. We mourn with confidence in Christ. And so, like Nehemiah, in our sorrow, in our mourning, we should continue praying before the God of heaven. We should pray. And whenever it's possible, we should act. So Nehemiah's suffering was heartfelt, it was extended, it was hopeful. But the fourth aspect is, is the most extraordinary, the most Christ-like, and I think the most important for us to imitate, and the most contrary to our nature. Nehemiah's sorrow was for others. 
It was a compassionate sorrow. We were very easily feel grief over things that affect us personally. If my friend has died, if my body is sick, if my finances are drained, if, if my children are suffering, this affects me, and so naturally I will mourn over them. But when it's your problem, Nehemiah was not personally affected in any way by the state of Jerusalem. The city could have been burned to the ground and every person in it killed. And it would not have affected Nehemiah's position in Susa. It would not have affected his job. It would not have affected his position with the king. It would not have affected his immediate family. Nehemiah could have completely ignored the problems. Not my problem. I have to bring the cup to King Artaxerxes. It's only a problem for those Jews living in Jerusalem. Nehemiah could have moved on with his life. But he doesn't. Nehemiah mourns for the sake of these others. And he speaks to the king for the sake of others. He prays for the sake of others. He travels to Jerusalem for the sake of others. He, he organizes and labors in the rebuilding of the wall for the sake of others. He pays personally for the upkeep of the governor's mansion and in office for the sake of others. He enforces obedience to the law of the Lord for the sake of others. Nehemiah was not personally suffering by the state of Jerusalem, and he did not personally benefit in any way from his efforts in or for Jerusalem. He acted entirely out of compassion that he felt for the people of God. They were suffering. And he would feel their suffering with them. He, he would enter into and share their suffering. And then he would work to relieve that suffering as they shared it. And all Christians are commanded by God to live this way. Um, Book of Hebrews tells us to remember those in prison as though in prison with them. Philippians Chapter 2, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Galatians, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans, chapter 12, weep with those who weep, and rejoice with those who rejoice. It doesn't matter if it's affecting you personally or not. You're united in Christ. Christians. Share in one another's suffering. Jesus commanded us that second great commandment of the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he told his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. In the face of suffering among our neighbors, and especially among those of the household of God, we cannot just say, it's not my problem. We can't just say, well, it's, it's not affecting me. I can live with it. We must love each other. We must love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We must suffer with them as though we ourselves were suffering. And we must do what we can to help. Will we do this? Will we follow the example of Nehemiah? Will we mourn and act for the sake of others when we don't? have to. There's more here than a command laid upon us. There's, there's a danger as we read this of starting to think that yeah, we're like Nehemiah. We're these great and important people and we need to act on the behalf of those poor, pitiful people out there. And again, there is the case, again, we do need to, as we're able, help others in their suffering. But in truth, we're, we're not in the place of Nehemiah here. We, we're the exiles. We are those in great trouble and shame. We're the ones with the walls of our lives broken down and our gates burned. We are, are wretched and pitiful and poor and powerless to help ourselves. We have been conquered by a vile enemy far greater than Nebuchadnezzar, far greater than the Babylonian Empire, far greater than the peoples of the land. We are enslaved by sin to Satan who hates us 
and will dominate our lives and destroy us if we are not rescued from the chains of sin with which we have been bound. But a prince, our prince, is aware of our helpless position and he has come to save us. Jesus Christ has come to us and helped us and rescued us because he has compassion on us. Our sin, our fall into sin, did not affect God. All three persons of the Trinity could have left us condemned in our sins and continued eternally and perfectly happy forever with all of us in hell. God was not lonely. God did not feel a need of fellowship with us, so he had to create us or rescue us. He does not depend upon our worship, and he is not obligated to save us. But he chose to do so. God is rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love. And so he chose to love us with his great love. He chose to have compassion on us. He chose to rescue us. As Nehemiah would leave the king's presence and travel into Jerusalem. So Jesus left the Father's side. He left the throne of heaven, the gaze of angels, to come into the world. Emmanuel, God with us. As as Nehemiah would resist the, the threats and the lies of Tobiah and Sanballat and, and the other governors and rulers of the peoples who don't want to see Jerusalem's walls rebuilt. So Jesus would resist the temptations of Satan, the threats of Herod, the opposition of the Pharisees and the Sadducees so that he might bring us this truth and grace. As Nehemiah and his servants labored day and night hammer in one hand, sword in the other. So Jesus labored, often teaching and healing from morning until late in the evening, and then rising again early in the morning that he might go out to a desolate place and pray. He labored for our sakes. As Nehemiah enforced the law of Moses for the good of the people, so Jesus calls us to obey the perfect law of Christ. Not as a burden placed upon us, but as a gentle yoke leading us in the ways of goodness and peace and happiness. As Nehemiah did not take the governor's food allowance, but paid for the upkeep at his own expense, so Jesus takes nothing from us, but fully pays for our redemption with his own precious blood. Jesus did not use money to serve us and rescue us, but he gave up his own life as a ransom for many. He took our sins upon himself. He bore the wrath of the Father against those sins so that we might be delivered. And he gives us his own perfect righteousness that we might be accepted in God's presence of, of all the wonderful gifts you might receive this Christmas. And I hope you receive great and wonderful gifts. The greatest of all gifts is the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's salvation. It's freedom from sin. It's freedom from wrath. It's fellowship with God. You have not earned it. You could not earn it. You have not worked for it. But Jesus, because of the compassion, the love, and the mercy that He has on us. He has done it. He is our Savior, our champion, our hero. He's our rescuer. He has done it. After, after reading the book of Nehemiah, it, it's so easy to, to just picture yourself as, as one of these Jewish exiles. And I mean, Nehemiah has to be the hero He's George Washington of the Jerusalem exiles. He's done everything for us. He's done everything well. He's, he's rescued us from our difficult position. How much more should we look to Jesus with constant gratitude and ceaseless joy for the saving compassion that he's had on us and the power that he's used to rescue us? There's a, a quote um, from one of the Puritans, John Flavel, 
Um, he, he entitled it The Father's Bargain. I, I read it here, it's probably two and a half years ago since the last time I quoted this. Um, it's, it's, it's an imagining of the agreement between the Father and Son to save sinners. It just expresses, I think, more of, of the compassion that Jesus has on us, that the Trinity has upon us. This is what Flavel wrote. Here you may suppose the Father to say, when driving his bargain with Christ for you, the Father says, My son, here is a company of poor, miserable souls that have utterly undone themselves and now lie open to my justice. Justice demands satisfaction for them or will satisfy itself in the eternal ruin of them. What shall be done for these souls? And thus Christ returns, O oh, my Father, such is my love to and pity for them, that rather than they shall perish eternally, I will be responsible for them as their surety. Bring in all thy bills, that I may see what they owe thee. Lord, bring them all in, that there may be no after reckonings with them. At my hand shalt thou require it. I will rather choose to suffer thy wrath than that they should suffer it. Upon me, my Father, upon me be all their debt. And the Father says, But my son, if thou undertake for them, thou must reckon to pay the last might. Expect no abatements. If I spare them, I will not spare thee. And the Son says, Content, Father, let it be so. Charge it all upon me. I am able to discharge it. And though it prove a kind of undoing to me, though it impoverish all my riches, empty all my treasures, yet I am content to undertake it. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Flavel ends his passage with a call for ungrateful believers to blush with shame at their apathy and complaints about walking with Christ. He was speaking to a particular audience. And if you have been shrinking back from Christ, if you have been ashamed of His name, if you've been grumbling at His laws, then indeed you should blush to, to grumble so against the one who has so loved and had compassion on you. But this also is a call for the, the weak the despondent, the sorrowing, the hopeless believer. You are not hopeless. Your, your troubles may be great. Certainly, our sins are beyond our ability to overcome. But we are not hopeless. Christ is our hero. He loves us. He cares for us. He is a far greater champion than Nehemiah with far more power and far more riches to expend upon your behalf. And he has pledged himself to do so. He knows your needs. He knows your troubles. He knows your sins. And he came into the world to save sinners. Even the foremost. He will deliver you from your sin. He will bring you to the greatest of all possible goods, everlasting fellowship, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we should rejoice and trust and follow our champion who has and will deliver us because of the great love and compassion that he has for us. As we, as we continue through the month of December, to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Let us remember it, it's, not, it's not just about the birth of a baby. It's about the birth of a Savior who saved us. Jesus is greater in every way than Nehemiah. He's greater in every way than everyone in the world. He's greater than our problems. He's greater than our troubles. He is greater than our sin. So let us trust and rejoice in Him. Let's pray together.
Fathers, as we end our time together this morning, I ask that you would, by your Spirit, cause us to feel more of our fallen state. That we would see that apart from your Son and your grace, we are far worse off than exiles in a city without a wall. Lord, open our eyes that we might see the fierceness of your wrath, the depth of the devil's hatred for us, and the impossibility of our situation. But Lord, let us see also more and more of the power and grace that Jesus Christ has lavished upon us. Lord, will you set us free from every competing affection and every competing confidence. We might trust in your Son and none other. That we might rejoice in your Son and none other. Lord, we do love you and we trust you and we ask we'd come to love and trust you more. We believe that we have overcome the world because of our faith in your Son. Continue to help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.